Welcome to Ruck Up Podcast. To help support our guests, check out the show notes below. Also, check us out on all your social media platforms. If you have any comments, questions, or concerns, hit us up. On today's Slide episode... The Baghdad, where we corkscrewed in so violently that I thought we were actually like dying at any given point. Yeah, yeah. That first run when you're going from the airport to the green zone and like the guys Check out the show notes for all the loud. information for our guests and also call us in, let us know your story so you can hear it on the air. Hi, my name is uh, Morgan Lorette. I was a private security contractor with Blackwater from July 2004 to literally like January 1st, 2006. Uh, prior to that, I was, I was an, an airman in the United States Air Force. And the only reason I joined the Air Force is because my grandfather was in the Army and he said that the food was so much better in the Air Force. <laughs> so that's how, that's how I decided I was going to uh, go into the armed services. Uh, I was in security forces, so the MPs of the Air Force. Uh, my claim to fame back then is we were the first security forces uh, to go into Iraq during the ground offensive in 2003. So that was my, that was my combat experience. Uh, but really, we just sat in uh, DFPs and made sure people didn't uh, drive their trucks on the flight line while planes were trying to land. Uh, and then uh, just just kind of out of luck, uh, I had a buddy who who joined up from Blackwater. He was a he was a force recon marine, and he went out to Moyoc in, in June 2004. And he was like, you can do this. And I was like, no way, man. I just saw those contractors that got hanged on a bridge in Fallujah. I'd like, this is just yeah. not my gig. And uh, he apparently wouldn't for an answer, reached out to one of the people there and said, yeah, call Morgan. He, you could probably talk him into it. So I got a random call at 6 a.m. from a guy from Blackwater. He's in, he, and are you ready to go? And I was like, yes. And I thought, geez, he was either the best salesman or the worst because <laughs> that was absolutely not, not what I intended. <clears throat> so right. I found myself a couple weeks later out in Moyoc, North Carolina. Um, ended up doing their, their two week WPPS course, which is like world worldwide protective services, something along those lines. Um, I was in the fourth class that ever went through got my security clearance. Uh, and then I was four days later, I was on a, on a flight to Baghdad from Amman, Jordan, um, How many, got into, I just want to, I just want to kick back to the class while you're talking about that. Um, that class alone how many people do you think went through that class at the time period that you were going through? Cause I know that there was a lot of people that would be filtered through during that time period. Right. Yeah. So the first couple of classes had about 10 people each and then class three bumped up to about 20. We had about 25 by the time you got done with it, you filtered out about a third of them. So we right, graduated right. 18 and then maybe, maybe 13 of us made it over because a lot of people had a problem with their security clearance. Um, it was also just <laughs> is, is the same time that uh, President Bush and uh, Secretary Kerry were, were running for president and all their stuff was going through the Department of State. So it was, it was right. pretty, you either had to get your clearance fast or it was going to take a really long time. So uh, right. after that, somewhere when they started getting into class like eight, nine, and 10, they were, they were pumping out 50, 75 people per, per class pretty easily. Yeah, the contracts were getting pretty busy at that point, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, sorry, carry on. So I I uh, I flew into I flew into Baghdad, and uh, I'm a proud Arizona native, but I've never been in a place that hot and disgusting in my <laughs> life. So we we hop off the plane, um, and, and we take the the run to to uh, the green zone, which is Brad Irish. It's the most yeah. Everybody knows this. They tell you you're going to have all these like armored vehicles and one M16. And they said, okay, well, don't, don't even load your rifle yet until we get going. I thought, what the hell did I get myself into? Yeah, yeah. This is, this is crazy pants. So we're in soft skin vehicles. We make the run. They drop us off at the team house. There's beer everywhere. I'm thinking, holy cow, like I might be in heaven. I'm 23 years old. There's beer here. Uh, got assigned my first team. It was Templar 12. So the team names were based off of the Knights Templar. Uh, yeah. They were always like two, four, six, eight, twelve. So we were the sixth team. They handed me a brand new M4 rifle right out of the box. Uh, it was like watching a baby being born. Like I just <laughs> held it. I just held it and just wanted to sit in my arms forever. Um, and then they handed me like a, a Glock 9 mil. 
and they said, all right, come back to the team tent tomorrow, pretty much. So yeah. the first couple of days, you're just trying to figure out what's going on. But as soon as you get there, everybody's like, we got to go to the pool. We got to start drinking. So it's just like right off the bat, you're, you're sitting there as a private security contractor doing things that the military is, is completely frowning upon. And you're walking around like right. king shit at Turd Hill. Like yeah. it, it, it was just the craziest thing. Um, yeah. So Templar 12 hooked onto a mission for the regime crimes liaison team. Um, those were the guys that were collecting evidence for the trial of Saddam Hussein, Chemical Ali. Um, so essentially we, we had the Iraqis collecting. We would make sure there was chain of custody to be able to say, yes, this is admissible in court or international court. Um, mm -hmm. But it, it really turned out that we were collecting everything. And then, you know, we just had some Iraqis that were, that were sitting on the side watching us do it. Right. Um, that was my first trip up to little JSS up in northern Baghdad, uh, where it turned out that's where Saddam Hussein was hanged. So I got some cool pictures of the gallows and, yeah, yeah. um, next, next thing I know we're, we're heading to a flight up, uh, up in Kurdistan we stay at this hotel. Uh, they, they essentially were like, well, you guys are going to go village to village and every village had the same story, right? It was like. All the military age males that were essentially my age back in uh, 1993, so they're between 12 and 20, they rounded them up and they shot them. So you have these villages, and it's just all females that are older and then younger kids that are below the age of like 12, 13. Um, but it was just, I mean, it was, it's just heartbreaking. Just the yeah. on fall product, uh, the on fall campaign with chemical Ali up there just slaughtered the Kurds after we left in uh, 1993. Yeah. So I uh, did that for about six weeks. We had a mini muni. We got tired of sitting there eating all this, all the same local food. Uh, the, the, the main perk of that is we actually adopted a dog up there. Cutest little thing, but you can't really house, you can't house break a dog uh, when you're sitting in a <laughs> hotel. So he just pissed, pissed and crap all over pissed the place. Over. It was, it was yeah, great yeah, fun. Yeah. But if, but if you ever needed, like, pick me up, you just go over there and play with the, the dog. Uh, we named him Suli because yeah. we were up in Sulaymaniah. And then yeah. I had to leave the dog, sadly, go back down to Baghdad. Uh, jumped on another, another team. It was Templar 24. Uh, we didn't really have a mission. So we were just kind of on bitch to kill all the time. Uh, right. They sent me over to uh, Camp Liberty once to, to protect John Bolton. And I was like, dude, this is awesome. Like that guy plays right, the saxophone. Right. He's got this curly yeah. hair. Can't wait to meet him. He's got to be here for USO tour. And it turned out it was, it was uh, Michael or it was uh, John Bolton. It was the uh, ambassador to the U.S. The guy right, with the right. big mustache that. Yeah. 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 You know, just he, he must, book. He must have been pretty and, sad. Uh, good, but I did get to meet Charlie Daniels. So that was pretty cool, man. Rest in peace there, Chuck. Oh, cool. Yeah. <laughs> I was, I was. <laughs> Um, and then I, I went home, I did my first like days of leave, came back, got on the QRF team and, and we just ran roughshod through Baghdad for like three to four months. It was, it was crazy. So right around that same time, it was April, uh, I believe it was April 17th, uh, 2005 is when we had seven Blackwater contractors killed, um, when the helicopter got shot down, yeah. we had another uh, Blackwater contractor die on his way, um, in from Ramadi. So, um, definitely, uh, definitely took that out on the local population a little bit more than, and I'd like to admit, and probably Eric Prince would like to admit, but, yeah. uh, did that for about three months. Cool story. Got fired. That's what everybody does at Blackwater. Uh, you go there. <laughs> everybody. The department hired. <laughs> oh, it's crazy. Yeah. And it, I mean, it's beautiful for the State Department because they say, well, we contract for Blackwater and you're a contractor for Blackwater. So they just go to Blackwater and they say, hey, fire that guy. He was he was stealing the armor off the Humvee. Yeah. I was like, no, no, that, that's not your armor. That's our armor. We, we gave bottles of Jack Daniels to the Army and they just gave us whatever we wanted. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So so I'm, I'm just I'm just one of the, the normal people that got fired within their first year. Uh, instead of firing me, they sent me up to Kirkuk. Um, I was a, it was a DOD contract. So, so at that time, just to kind of give background at that time is when we were moving from 
uh, it being a combat mission under DOD to being a uh, diplomatic mission for Department of State. So that's why you saw a big influx of talk um, yeah. to be on those State Department contracts. So I got on a DOD contract, and then that ended three weeks later, and then they just said, ah, Morgan, nobody knows who you are, just stay on this Department of State contract. So little old me, 24 years old, make me a team leader. I like Navy oh, yeah. SEALs that are reporting to me. I got like special forces dudes. I got recon Marines. And I'm like this Air so, Force security so forces. Like, that's what I was just dipshit. about to say. So and I'm was, thinking so. I'm way over my <laughs> head here. Um, yeah, that's what I was going to say. I was going to say, did you, uh, so did you I, li little bit of your, your Air Force ego come out at that point and just kind of, you know, did, did you make <laughs> people eat shit for a little bit or what? No, no, I, I just, I just, uh, you know, tucked my tail between my legs and showed my belly like a dog. You know, I was like, oh, it's fine. And the, the weirdest thing is that, like, kids will be kids, right? They always push their limits, so they're like, oh, it's a new team leader. And I had worked with these guys for for over a year at that point, and uh, on our first run, walk over to a to uh, one of our suburbans, and there's these two rangers that are sitting there like. Uh, three days prior and they're just like racked out and i go back to the the other hummer and my buddy who i've known the entire time i've been there is like he's got his armor off he's just hanging out talking and i was like put your fucking yeah. shit on and get out there and, and like replace everybody and go wake those fuckers up so i had to have my first come to jesus meeting after my first run where yeah, yeah, yeah. he'd go in there and like yell at everybody and slam the door like you're a teenage girl and then uh, <laughs> after, after that, we we ran pretty smooth. Uh, <laughs> oh, come on. You enjoyed that for a little uh, bit. So you have like, you know, just a, a little tiny bit, a little, <laughs> a little baby, you know, a little baby bit. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, we we pretty much just did long range missions up there uh, trying to help build up the, the um, governments up in Kurdistan. So you have two primary factions up there. Uh, both of them kind of lay fay or lay stake to being the local government for Kurdistan. Um, so it was pretty much trying to placate them with State Department people uh, so that they didn't grab their Peshmerga forces and try to take over Kirkuk and the oil fields and all that. Uh, so, so I mean, it's, it's just such a contrast. It's beautiful up there. It's mountainous. Um, it reminds me of like, like high desert um, stuff that you see even out here in Arizona as you go north of Phoenix. Right. Uh, cool at night, just absolutely gorgeous up there. Uh, but it was, it, we had a great chow hall, we had a great gym. I was like, well, I think I'll just stay here for a bit. So, uh, right about December, December 23rd, I've, I, I could tell you the date. Um, we all got drunk, and then I decided to go into the U.S. Embassy and for some reason punch out the mirror of the uh, the bathroom in there. No idea why. Like the first time I've ever blacked out my life was in a combat zone. Yeah. So so I got fired again. Uh, it was the end of my contract, so I didn't get fired. They told me to you know come back and they'll put me somewhere not in Kirkuk. But um, yeah, yeah, yeah. by then I just kind of realized that it, it's so intoxicating. It's like this intoxicating of of like elixir of of money and being treated like a badass. And and I I knew I had to uh, you know I had to get out. So I actually. Finished up my my undergraduate degree, and yep. uh, joined the army as an officer, as an intel officer, and then they sent me back to frickin' Iraq in 2009. Man, they sent me back to uh, the same JSS I mentioned where Saddam Hussein was hanged. Um, yeah, and yeah. I was like, this is God's got a sense of humor because yeah, yeah. this isn't funny. <laughs> this isn't funny. Yeah, but at this time you don't get the luxury of the food and the beer, so. Unfortunately, <laughs> no, and well, I, was, had to, I had to call people sir and stuff. Yeah. Weird. Right. So when you <laughs> went back there though, what was, um, what was the overall feeling you went back there? You said 2009, you were done, uh, with Blackwater, what, 2006, 2007, what yeah, was, oh six. what, what was the, what was the difference in the environment when you went back to Iraq? It's interesting. So I was there for the ground offensive and you could put on your nods and you could see all, all the stuff exploding. So it felt like like you were in a real war. Uh, I got to Baghdad in 04 and 
it like we were getting mortared all the time. It was just there was always um, people in the streets and pissed off, car bombs, you name it. Yeah. And then when I got back there in 2009, uh, it was very calm. It was very, it was like like watching the progression of war. And we were drawing down our our combat troops. And since I was combat support as Intel, I got to stay for the whole year, whereas most of my buddies left for like eight months. Right. Uh, but it was, it felt, it felt like it was just a, a vacuum waiting to happen. Like there wasn't a whole lot of of fighting. Um, but you could tell that there was just like it just felt, especially from an intel perspective, it just felt like everything was simmering, waiting for the U.S. forces to draw down. And then once that happened, where they they fit in that power vacuum. Right, right. So the calm before the storm. Needless to say, that's that's what, that's what it turned out to be too. So yeah. maybe maybe it's my hindsight. Yeah, or your good intelligence. Um, what is um. <laughs> So I uh, wanted to just, can you give a little bit of background of who, not who, but what Blackwater is to the listeners that, that, I mean, they know what Black, everybody knows who the fuck Blackwater is, but let's, let's kind of break it down into um, layman's terms for everybody. <laughs> yeah. So uh, uh, Blackwater started at, out in Moyak, North Carolina. Uh, Eric Prince started it, and he realized that he could be a lot more efficient than the ranges. And, and if you were ever in the military, you know that trying to get a range is like the biggest pain in the ass. So yeah. that's where it all started. And then when the war kicked off in 2003, um, I don't, I mean, who knows what happened? I'm sure Eric Prince was talking to all of his buddies, um, but it, it came up that there were all these contracts that were getting ready to start to protect diplomats. So yeah. having the network that he had, he just started reaching out and it started off as Navy SEALs, which is weird because they always carry their gun up, sit down, never understand that. Um, mm. But that's that's really where it started. Is he, is he started bidding on these con. Probably never will be another diplomatic mission as large as Iraq was, right? So you had a huge number of people that needed to be protected and the the state department just didn't have a clue how they were going to do it their their security core was made of a bunch of blubbering vaginas anyway and um, they they just didn't have the manpower so so that's really where it came from is is there was just there was just a there was a space that needed to be filled eric prince had the resources to be able to, to fill that space and then all of us Blackwater guys uh, went over there and protected diplomats. And I mean, it's everything from, you know, that that stuff, stuff that, like the regime crimes and watching Chemical Ali uh, go to trial, uh, all the way down to like, this diplomat wants to go to Burger King. Can you drive him over there and, and you know, go on the most bombed route in Baghdad and get this guy some Burger King? So yeah, yeah. It, it was just... It, it was bad war planning, if I'm being completely honest with you. Between Colin Powell and Donald Rumsfeld, they said, "Don't worry, guys. They're really going to be happy that we're there." And then, and then when shit out of them, they realized that, "Oh, we don't. We didn't want you guys to free the shit out of us. So now we right. just we have to figure out how to turn this into a diplomatic mission, and we just don't have, right. have the people. So it was really a necessary evil. There, there was nobody else that could have done it at that point." It's 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 funny because like when I try to explain it to people who are not involved in anything outside of a bubble, I guess you could say, when I say like there was literally blank checks being written, people laugh and they're like, oh yeah, well of course there's money. No, no, there's literally fucking blank checks being written. Like you don't understand this. There was so much money going through the system that Eric Prince and. I'm not knocking him down because he he did do pretty amazing things with a company that he had, but there was just who wouldn't use that 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 um, that industry to their benefit in that type of situation? Because if you found like he did, he he found a niche that that needed to be filled. Whether he was rubbing elbows with anybody, that's behind the scenes stuff. That's really you know it's way above my pay grade. But realistically, he found that niche, he went with it. And I mean, it's unfortunate the way it turned out, 
but realistically in my opinion blackwater kind of had it was a it was it was a bomb waiting to go off anyway you you did have individuals that um that were part of certain i guess missions you could say that probably shouldn't have been there um actually probably shouldn't have even been in the country but um i think that uh the vetting I mean, process myself included the uh, air force you, dude <laughs> well yeah but I think that the vetting process during that time, like any company, you have this huge influx of, of contracts coming in. You're not going to be able to get the, the, the manpower that you would want to have that would be like people that would need less supervision. Uh, and people are like, oh, well, they're ex-military, they're ex-this, they're ex-that. Well, there's still people at the end of the day, and they're still going to make mistakes, and they're still going to have different types of mindset. So it's... It, in my opinion, it was something that would have eventually happened just because of the sheer volume of work that was coming through there. You can't staff these 18 people with thousands and thousands of jobs just like that. That's, that's not realistic. Well, and it's not, it, it's not any different than if you're working, uh, let's say you, you, and somebody says, I want you to build a, a $3 million house. You don't have the capacity. You don't have the staff to be able to sit there and say, I'm just going to pull my four guys that I usually have build a house and build this $3 million house. It'll take you yeah. eight years and then you're not going to get the contract. So right. it's, it, it's the same, the exact same thing. It was just, there was a need and there was, there was just not enough people in the state department to be able to fill it. They didn't want to fill it with DOD personnel because they didn't want the face of diplomacy to be people that are sitting there in their camis. So yeah. they, they had to figure out a way to get it done. And uh, they also credit, wanted somebody I mean, to blame though. Yeah. I mean, it was, it, it's a nice little scapegoat. Uh, yeah. Um, to be able to say that, Oh, you know, one, you contract your body count on the news, right? And nobody yeah. cared about us. No. Um, easy to blame because we were all mercenaries, even though we are working literally for the, the state department of the United States. And if something happened, they could say, look, you know, oh, these rogue people, they're, they're terrible. It's like, you guys just didn't plan for this thing. So like, I don't want to be big. Yep. This is, this is the byproduct of what you guys created. Now, I want to go back to the point that you're talking about the training. Um, and I left out this question, but I want to ask it, ask it before we carry on. Um, when you were talking about going into the training, was there anybody that passed the training qualifications prior to you going over to Iraq that you would have been like, whoa, hold on a second. You're bringing that guy over? Like, was there ever second guessing on anybody? <laughs> oh, Christ almighty. Yeah, there was, there was a lot of them. And I'll bet you people thought the same thing about me. Um, oh, probably. <laughs> but <laughs> there, was, there was a dude, um, he was like a retired ranger instructor and... Uh, we were like a training exercise and they take the principal into this building and then they come upstairs for his meeting. And then you hear a couple of shots and somebody is like, the principal kidnapped. And me and he was a recon marine. We kind of like run through the door, we clear the stairs, we go up top, we get through the fatal funnel, we split across, we try to like neutralize the threat. This guy's holding the gun to our principal's head. And that ranger instructor was sitting at the bottom of the stairs, frozen like a fucking ice cube. It was yeah. like, dude, this is training, bro. Like, yeah. <laughs> you're freezing up in training. Like, well, yeah. what, what the hell are you doing? Um, but yeah. they, they, they did weed some of those guys out. Um, right. Some of them made it all the way through, even got their clearance. And then they were like, oh, Jesus. Like, I've yeah. never, none of the instructors say, have anything good to say about this guy. Like, we're just not going to send him over. And what was the what was the training level like? Was it uh, very similar to what you were going to experience when you were there, or was it just like two weeks is two weeks, right? So, yeah. So I mean, they they go through the the weeding out process. So the first thing you're gonna do is your uh, PT test, and then if you couldn't pass your PT test, you were gone, which was my yeah. on a half run, push up, sit up, five pull ups. It wasn't a big deal. Right. Uh, and then and then from there you go to the ranges. Uh, if you can't shoot, you can't go. And then after that, it was really like you, you do tactical driving um, because the way you you protect the diplomats, not like you're driving Miss Daisy down to the Walmart, right? They got to <laughs> teach you how to 
how to like yeah. put your vehicle in front of the vehicle of the principal so that if something blows up over here you die and the principal like lives um yeah yeah and then and then the, we did some uh cqb we did like walking principles to and from places so you you essentially create a diamond where the principal's in the middle and then you have point people on any side they they're kind of covering all fields of fire as you walk in and like posting up and but it, it wasn't it wasn't anything that even as an air force guy i hadn't already done at some point it was yeah it was well, fairly you- rudimentary when you got to Iraq and they put you on your first detail, uh, what was your what was your impression of what 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 was your mindset before, and then what was your kind of your thought process after you started your detail? Like, is this were you like, oh fuck, like this is not what I pictured at all? Like, you you were you've already been to Iraq, so you know what the the ground layout is, but the actual works work itself. Yeah, I mean, there wasn't really as much work as you thought there was going to be. They tell you you're going to be there six, you're going to work six days a week. You have the seventh off. You'll get paid for every day you're in country. Um, and then some days you just didn't work and you'd string across like three, four days of not working because there was no mission. And then some days you would, you would, you would run 13, 14 missions all the way through a couple of weeks. Um, it was definitely like if you've ever driven in Europe, it's like that where there's there's three lanes but there's five cars across um <laughs> yeah, yeah but all those but all those cars you're like okay is this one gonna blow me up like oh, yeah, I'm yeah, the yeah. Eiffel Tower. Is this gonna be the one so yeah. um very very defensive driving very it was very aggressive um but it 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 wasn't anything where like hold up what am i doing here freaking out yeah i I, you would have to have, you would have to have eight thousand cars driving around Moyak, and just try to weave your way through them. You know, right, right, right. How many, how many rounds did you end up putting through any <laughs> engine blocks? Uh, Eric Prince has stated repeatedly that we did over forty thousand missions, and we only <laughs> shot two hundred times. Um, me personally, is that in the, is that I, in a day I, or is that in in the, in the, the entire project? <laughs> no, that's through the entire contract, is what he said. But yeah. uh, we yeah. were put. Oh, we and were, I know I'm very very aware of what he said, but whether or not I believe yeah. it is a very another story. <laughs> <laughs> no, we were we were pumping out around. We were probably shooting three or four times on every run. The QRF would do. Um, anywhere between four and eight runs a day. Um, yeah. And, and even, even that, like you, as I alluded to earlier, there's no, there was no adult supervision. So there's nothing right. telling like, why would you call in a shoot? It's just going to make yeah. everything more miserable. Well, but yeah, yeah. I mean, from, from a moral perspective, to your point, we, we shot a heck of a lot of engine block, but we didn't like blast a bunch of people um, because no, no. No. like you just, you want to keep cars away from you. Yeah. um to keep to neutralize the threat but yeah it's, it was tires god when you shoot a tire when you're driving in a humvee and there's like a car that's coming this way shoot a tire from like two moving vehicles you feel like a badass and you get to hear it go pop, pop. yes i'm sure the driver doesn't feel that way <laughs> well at least it's a tire you know yeah 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 but the that's what like they don't really understand either. I mean, they've been dealing with it for a few years, but I think that they were more in the, plus the translation issue, even with an interpreter, interpreter was a, a little weak, but um, uh, they don't really understand either what was happening dur- during day to day either, especially with new drivers or anything on the roads. Um, they were probably more confused than anybody else what was going on. Yeah, so um, I, I have no way to verify this, but I, I was told that uh, the regime would only let certain people drive. Okay. So once we came in there, everybody dusted off their you know 1984 Peugeot, and it was painted right, right. orange, orange and white. And was like, I'm getting yeah. on the road. I got the freedom. And yeah. I mean, it's like it's like going out to to the old folks home and just giving them a bunch of keys and, and having a demolition derby. I mean, they were running into each other a hell of a lot more than we were. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. it was, it was people that didn't understand the rules of the road. Uh, they, they just were trying to get where they needed to get as fast as they possibly could. And then, but 
but you don't drive up on a Humvee. You don't drive up on a Suburban. No. Like, like we're still kind of in a war, guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Everybody yeah. play nice. All right. So uh, I want we want to talk about your book. So if you can yeah. tell everybody what your book is called, and let's start with a little bit of what it's about. Yeah, so it's called Welcome to Blackwater. Um, and, and it's essentially like following me through the exploits that I've, I've kind of outlined here and, and quite a few more that um, I, I probably won't even be able to get into. But it's really um, kind of going through where things happened, why they happened the way they did, what did Blackwater do, why did, why did Blackwater even have a contract, um, the camaraderie of, of being a private security contractor very similar to being in the military it's like you know yeah. you have best friends uh except for like three three months later they're rotating back home and you'll never see them again because they go to kirkuk or alhilla or one of those other places um so the transient lifestyle with the camaraderie and just absolute hilarity i mean so if you if you go to my website uh welcome to blackwater.com i have an excerpt in there where we're driving like 75 miles an hour uh, to go drop off our principal and one of the guys in the truck is like gotta pull over dude i gotta pull over i'm gonna shit my pants and we're <laughs> like i'm like dude we can't pull over we're already late and he's like he's grabbing an mre bag trying to figure out how he's going to take a shit in this thing as we're rolling <laughs> in the humvee and he ends up taking a dump in like a an ice in the back and the whole smelled like satan's breath right like it was like the worst smell in my, of my entire life yeah, and then yeah. and then you get up there and you're like that didn't seem that abnormal like, <laughs> that's just another day contracting and it's right. it's it's just in the conversations when you when you're hanging out with special operations guys everything's like a dick measuring contest so yeah. it's like who's got the who's got the best hooker story who's got the coolest story about you know their service um it, it was just every day, like you, you just go to sleep and your sides would hurt from laughing your ass off so much. Yeah. Well, what, what brought you to bringing the book, writing about the book, writing the book, fuck, fuck words. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I kept telling these stories to people, uh, and they'd be like, Jesus Christ, like, like, there's no way, like th this doesn't even make any sense at all. And I, I would tell stories and people would be like, you just need to put it in a book. You need to put it in a book. And then 15 years later, I just kind of got pissed off on day. I was like, fuck it, I'm going to write a book. So it really just started off as a bunch of stories. Um, yeah. Everything from like the flight into to Baghdad where we corkscrewed in so violently that I thought we were actually like dying at any given point. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And then that first run when you're going from the airport to the green zone and like the guy's blasting music as loud as he can. And you're sitting there like freaking out, moving, moving your eyes and your head with your rifle and then nothing happens or yeah. driving, driving down a route that you ran the day before. And there's this big crater and you just end up like slamming into this crater where there was a VBIED and you feel like the, the vehicle is going airborne. Like it's just every day was like, an adventure but still it was 95 percent of it was just like just like all combat right like yeah mostly boredom sitting around sh bullshitting and 99 percent boredom five yeah. percent where you're like yeah exactly yeah yeah um yeah, so it's funny when i tell people about certain situations i'm like y you got to realize that um google maps doesn't work when it oh we didn't have fucking google maps and you did the road would have been <laughs> gone the next day anyway so it's not like the same situation where you get to fucking plan your routes and you're like, okay, we're going to go, uh, we're going to go drive a nice countryside road today and then find out <laughs> two seconds later that, oh shit, we can't go that way anymore. But, um, I did want to actually, uh, talk about, uh, I don't know if you uh, mentioned in your book, but I want to talk about Fallujah. Um, uh, can you tell everybody what happened there to kind of, I don't know really if it's a conspiracy or if it's a conspiracy theory, but most believe that that kind of triggered the whole events um, through Iraq. Um, can you explain what happened during that time period? Yeah. So um, that happened just before I started working for Blackwater, which is why I was like, hell no, I'm not going over there. Um, yeah. So we had four private security contractors. They were driving around in Fallujah. 
Um, I don't know what the hell they were thinking. Uh, I've, I've heard some stories of what they were what they were doing, uh, but they were in a single vehicle by themselves, soft skin vehicle, uh, four of them. You would normally never leave without 12 people, 12 or 13, right? Um, so, so why they were kind of alone and there was four people um, is, is still something that's probably up for debate. Uh, they were attacked and then they were dragged through the street of Fallujah and then they were they were hung from a bridge and and all the uh all the all the people sat there and screamed at them and hit them with sticks but at the end of the day you had four uh americans that were sitting there hanging from a bridge and it was very reminiscent of like somalia right um so it, it that i think that that is what got blackwater's name out there I don't think that that's the catalyst. I think that that's the okay. first time people said, why the hell are civilians actually in a combat zone at any time? Um, See, I, I argue that. You had, you, I, but you had like Custer Battle. Go ahead. But, but I argue that because private security contractors have been working military zones since the beginning of time. It is literally the oldest known profession on record is actually a, is actually a security detail. I mean, the, so why, why when people yeah. see things like this, is this such a, it's like, oh, fuck, why are they letting civilians run around uh, war zones all the time? Well, because we've been doing it since fucking days start. Like, it, this isn't new. And I think that that's where I kind of get a little bit uh, frustrated in conversations with people is because they make it sound like military is just, when you go into a combat zone, it's military versus military. And if you have that type of mentality that that's the actual reality where there's no civilians at all, we're talking about shopkeepers, we're talking about people that just live in residence, then you are so far gone from the from the realities of the situation. How is it no different than having contractors working there in military roles? And also, too, a contractor doesn't necessarily have to be a person with a firearm. It can be a uh, it can be a it can be a plumber, it can be an electrician, it could be fucking anything. Like we we had contractors over in military in military theaters that were just there to build shit, but they were still contractors yes. and they still had to take some of the same fucking courses we had to take. So in my opinion, it was it just it blows my mind how people's reality just kind of stops at the whole military complex. It just and it doesn't filter down to the proper areas that it's supposed to. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think if, if you've never served in the military, you don't see it as like having civilian contractors over there. Uh, like even when I was in the Air Force, you, you'd go to these different locations and they were building stuff, they were cooking, you know, like it, it was kind of normal for, for us. But from right. just a, a non-military background, I think it's very odd for people to think that you had security contractors um, that were going outside the wire that were driving around and could be attacked like that. Um, I, 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 I totally get your point, but if I told my grandma that there was security contractors back in 2003, she'd have been like, Morgan, why are you telling this? I, I don't care. But she also wouldn't yeah. have believed me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Very true. Very true. Um, so your book's coming out in November. Yeah. So it'll probably drop a little earlier than that. Um, probably somewhere around mid October. Um, welcome to blackwater.com. I got a couple of excerpts. I got some cool air, uh, blacked everybody's face out and stuff. So, so it looks yeah, yeah. like extra cool guy. Um, <laughs> but it, it, it's really just, uh, I, I tried to stay out of the politics of it. I, I don't want people, I want people to, to judge it based on its merits. Like we did good stuff. We did bad stuff. If yeah. you think that all the stuff we did was bad, there's evidence in the book that we did bad stuff. If you think everything we did was good, there's that same evidence. You guys can come to your own conclusions. Right. Uh, but if, at the end of it, I think there, my my final conclusion is that I mean, war is is a pretty futile thing at this point. It's it's just the scars of it compared to what you get out of it at this point. All the way going back from Vietnam, it's just not. There's there's got to be there's got to be a better way to do it. I mean, right. one maybe you should plan it. Like let's yeah. let's have a plan going in. <laughs> um, crazy. You mean there and wasn't then, one? <laughs> <laughs> and then and then like let's, 
so I was watching a documentary and it said like under Saddam, you had Sunnis and Shias and they all went to kind of the same schools. And then we went in there and, and helped create that sectarian divide of the Sunnis and the Shias. It's been going on for thousands of years. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. Um, but everybody was so scared to death of Saddam that they were like, well, I don't care about this guy's, you know, religious sect nearly as much right. as this guy who's going to, you know, beat me with a, with an electrical cord and rape my family. So right. we, we wreaked a hell of a lot of havoc in there, um, unintentionally, uh, just, just by invading it. Um, I'm not saying that, that we shouldn't have gone in there. War has been great to me. Uh, I made yeah. a lot of money. Yeah. I, Got my GI Bill, like paid for two college degrees. Um, war has been great for me. But at the end of the day, I, I don't think that it's been great for a lot of people. You see that yeah. with the suicide rates. Uh, you see that even contractor suicide rates are, are really high. Um, we've, we've had a number of the contractors I worked with that have taken their lives uh, just because they can't figure out where they, they fit into society is my assumption. And I've uh, so, talked to people. I've talked to people about that, about vets and suicide and contractors and suicide, uh, more so security labeled security and suicides. But um, we don't really have numbers backing our suicide rates up. Uh, there's, uh, uh, and, and I'm not saying we should, but it's just it's it's unfortunate that we don't know. Um, we we can't really statistically understand where we where we are with that. And it's unfortunate. Yeah, and and. You, Contractors bear the scars of wars, but they don't have the fallback um, that, that I think you get with the military, right? You can't you can't go to the VA and say I have post traumatic stress disorder because I was a contractor in two thousand and five. Um, yeah. They're they're not going to help you with with that stuff. I mean, maybe they would, but at the end of the day, I there is there is no security blanket that we have as a society, to our credit, kind of started wrapping around the military to say. Yes, we sent you into this ridiculous situation, and now we're going to help you out. Uh, and, yeah. and contractors are just kind of left out on a limb there. And is that because of the stigma behind the contractors that the government doesn't really want to place, not really blame, but they don't want to place support either? I don't. I mean, I, I just don't know if they can, right? You have to have that DD-214 to get into yeah. the VA. And if you're talking about, you know, so, so what happened when we... When we got over there in force in 2004, you had a lot of people that were special operations that didn't get yeah. their war on when they were in, right? Like right. We hadn't been in war since Vietnam. So you had these guys that were trained, heavily trained, and then they didn't get to do anything and they got pissed off and they ended up getting out. And this was their chance to go to war, right? This was their chance to get some war on. And I think that that is partially why uh, the reputation of private security contractors happened because this was people's first chance to take that training that they had back in the 80s, 90s, and actually execute war operations. Um, but if you got out in 1999 and you go to the VA and talk about your service in 2003, they're going to look at your DV-214 and say, can't, can't help you with that, man. Yeah. Um, what do you think is the future of uh, security companies, private security companies going forward? Um, now we obviously have we have smaller wars that are happening all over the globe that we actually do partake in. But what do you think is going to uh, we're we're never going to have another Iraq uh, at least not at least not to that scale unless there's a literally um, I wouldn't say a third world war, but I would say a conflict that um, that would that would probably match that of maybe two superpowers or something. Would you agree with that that the security realm will never be as as not really forgiving but pay wise and and compensation wise that it was in Iraq. Yeah, so it, it it'll never be as robust as it was. Um I, I can't imagine that it would ever be as robust as as when we were in Iraq and, and we had to have people coming from the outside to fill that gap. Um it's also not going away. So there are some people that I contracted with 15 years ago that are still in the contracting game, uh, which is crazy to me. But there's there's people in Afghanistan. There's probably some of them in Syria. Um, I think what you're seeing right now, even stateside in Portland and uh, Seattle, uh, is, is the federal government doesn't have and wouldn't 
even if they, they could get the manpower, it'd be so expensive to be able to flex federal law enforcement from one place to the other. So right. what I think is happening is with these private security forces, and they're saying, hey, we're going to send you to Washington, D.C. to protect these places so that we can take our federal trained, federally employed people and send them to Portland, to Seattle, to Wisconsin. Um, right. So it's it's never going away i'm on a job board um just for just for grins um and with the hurricane coming in there's a ton of people that are needing private security uh with all the riots there's a ton of people like the media is asking for private security as they go through you know when they walk yeah. in the chop zone yeah so it's it's here to stay you have to have some kind of adult supervision over it you can't do right. what we did in iraq where you just plop a beat, bunch of people down um and like I said earlier, the, the State Department people were just blubbering vaginas, and they weren't going to go out on missions with us. So they could have, right. they had no idea what we were doing. And if you're not willing to put your people at risk to make sure that like a mission's being executed, then then you get what you get. I mean, it, that's just that's just called life. Right. When you were over there, was there was there a need for the administration of Blackwater to oversee you guys? Or was it just basically free game, just to get the fucking job done? Let's get the job done, dude. I mean, it's, yeah. it was started with Navy SEALs, right? Um, and that's their whole thing is we'll just go in and get the job done. And um, the the real kind of juxtaposition was we were protecting people to build Iraq. And to do that, we were wreaking havoc on the local populace to get them from one place to the other. So what, I mean, Eric Prince says another thing where we, we never lost a diplomat uh, and, and we didn't, but that doesn't mean that we, you know, didn't smash into four bongo trucks on the way out to the <laughs> ministry of the interior. Yeah. True story. <laughs> uh, so, so um, what advice can you give somebody that's looking to get into private security nowadays? I mean, you've been out for a little bit, but you you still keep your ear to the ground. So what would you say? Don't do it. Don't do it. Man, don't do it. Um, and I only say that because I, I think that they're they're just they're scapegoats. They're 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 yeah, they're single serving coffee cups, right? Like they can they can bring you in <laughs> and they can they can take you out whenever they want. And if something happens like they're not going to be like, oh, that was us. We did that. We contracted with them. They're going to say, oh, that guy did it. And and yeah, it's it, it's kind of a shame. Um, I would say if you really want to get into private security, um, do it when you're retired. You know, get all your cool guy stuff in, and then do it as a side hustle, and be very right. selective of who you do it with, because. Uh, Blackwater uh, trained us better than most. They equipped us better than most. We had every resource that we needed for the most part. Um, but not every company is going to do that for you. Right. But let's let's backtrack a little bit. They were getting some pretty hefty fucking money from each one of you guys going out there. So they had the money to spend on stuff, on training and, and equipment where the newer companies that were coming in that were trying to maybe lowball um, Blackwater which by the way, when Blackwater left, that was the greatest thing that ever happened to some of these other companies, but yeah. they, they couldn't afford, they couldn't afford the fancy gear you guys had. I mean, that's why you, that's why all those pictures of Blackwater guys, you can they were all suited up and you, you even said it yourself, you got a brand new fucking firearm when you walked in there. I mean, that's, that was rare. That's even rare oh, nowadays. Yeah. Usually, Usually you're going with a couple of guys down to the black market for a day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I just, I, I think that your, your risk reward going forward is, is going to be a lot higher than it was um, because there's going to be more tracking, but there's not going to be any, there's not going to be a protection over you. Um, right. There's still four people sitting in jail now. Um, and then we can debate the merits of whether or not it was a good shoot or not for Nisser Square. Um, but at the end of the day, four people were told that they were going to have immunity if they um, essentially told the story. And then as soon as they said, because that's what they told us when we got there. Hey, 
Yeah. If we do an investigation, you have immunity from it. It's not a big deal. And then uh, the second that somebody had a chance, they 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 hung those poor bastards. Um, and I I could be completely wrong about this, but I haven't ever seen Eric Prince going over there and giving lawyers money to to help spring them. Um, right. Like at, at the end of the day, can you do you want to take that risk? Yeah. No. A hundred percent. Uh, can you tell everybody where to find your book and just uh, give us some links and some a uh, little bit more advertising towards your book at the end of the show? Yeah, yeah. So head on over to welcome to blackwater.com. Um, so just regular welcome. Um, you can you can go on to the first page has all the cool guy pictures. So you can be like, oh, man, that was so awesome. But most of them you're at the range. I'll be honest. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> and then uh the second the second tab uh has some additional pictures the third tab is where you can order the book you can pre-order it now um i'll sign that beast uh i i i mean anybody that spent some time over in iraq or afghanistan has walked into those porta johns and they like those big dicks drawn all over it and like women with their legs spread and all that like i'll draw some nasty shit on it for you if you want <laughs> You know, personalized note, draw a big old fat dick on it, sign it, send it <laughs> off to you. Um, I should have the books in hand somewhere around mid-October. The day I get them is going to be within three days. I'll ship them out. And then uh, the final tab has a couple of excerpts. It's got the poop story and all of its amazing glory, taking a dump in the cooler. <laughs> um, uh, the, a story about us, and, and the mass graves up in, in northern Iraq. Uh, and then that's where you'd go for like some of the additional content. I, ooh, I got some, I got some mores falling around me. It's a <laughs> um, but uh, I'll I'll put some additional con uh, some content on there. So I was every time I talked to one of my Blackwater buddies, they're like, "Did you write about this? Did you write about that?" And I was like, "Dude, it's already a three hundred page book. I right. can't I can't write about every single thing." So yeah. I think the next story will be like when we would pull up to the market and all of our all of our uh, suburb signal those signal cancelers. So we'd pull up to this market and we push the button and everybody's cell phone would go down and you'd have people looking at their phone and then <laughs> we turn it back on and they'd get service and they'd be like oh, and they call and then we turn that shit back on again and we'd laugh and laugh. <laughs> um, but it, it's just just stupid stuff like that. But it, I mean it. Yeah. it the book will will take you through the entire journey of Blackwater without getting into the politics and the bullshit. It's just yeah. it's just funny story after funny story, uh, some heart wrenching stuff in there, um, but most of it, you know, so many hooker stories. I never bought a hooker, but my God, those special operations dudes love them some hookers. Thank you for listening to the full episode of Ruck Up Podcast. We wish you all to be very safe out there in your line of duty. And if you have a story to tell and want to be on the show, please check us out on all the social media sites, our website at www.rockupmedia.com, and check us out on our show notes and any other way you can get a hold of us. Stay safe out there, and we'll catch you on the flip side. Peace out.